It can often seem odd to speak of accelerating intelligence. Do you draw a significant distinction between intelligence and wisdom? And if you do, do you see any acceleration of wisdom to match the acceleration of intelligence? I do, actually. Uh, and if you watch CNN and the news, you might get the impression that there's a lot of irrationality in the world, which is true. But we now get a front row seat on all the irrationality and all the destruction. I mean, there might have been a battle in World War II where 20,000 people died, but you didn't see that in your living rooms. Maybe you saw it on the great newsreel a few weeks later. Uh, there actually is a decrease in war, a decrease in deaths in war. It's not down to zero, and it's not where we want it to be, which is zero. But uh, there is a, a great uh, democratization movement. I predicted in the 1980s that the Soviet Union uh, would basically be swept away, or totalitarian control would be swept away because of this emerging decentralized electronic communication. And I wrote that in my first book in the 1980s, and that's exactly what happened. And we've had this great wave of democratization through the 90s at the political level and at other levels of society. Now, there are some notable holdouts, but if you go back 50 years, there are only a handful of democracies in the world. We really have made a lot of progress. And we have this, we talk about wisdom, there is a wisdom of crowds. Now, crowds aren't always wise. You can have mob reason, which is not very wise. But there are ways of actually tapping the wisdom of a crowd, which can be much greater than any of its individual members. Google is based on that concept. You don't have the Google librarian saying, no, this will be the first link, and that'll be the second link when someone searches for nanotechnology. No, it's done through self-organizing method based on what everyone else does, what everyone else has searched for, and all the links of all the sites. It's basically harnessing the wisdom of crowds, and there's been a lot of literature on how a crowd, if, if, if the information is tapped correctly, can really uh, create greater insight than any one individual. Blogs are like that. Any one blog is unreliable, but the whole blogosphere actually can uncover the truth of, of, a, of an issue uh, in ways that uh, weren't feasible before we had that uh, wizard of crowds. And that's what these computer networks facilitate by being able to tie together in communication links millions of people. In your last article in East School News, you said it might be possible for most adults to live long enough to see the whole of the 21st century provided we could just hang on for another 10 years or so. That was in 2003. How are we doing? Well, I'm still here. <laughs> and you're still here. <laughs> Have you uh, modified I, your prediction any since then? No. I mean, we, we took, uh, that book actually came out in, in late 2004, a fantastic voyage, live long enough to live forever. We talked about three bridges to radical life extension. And bridge one is really what you can do right now to be healthy and slow down aging and disease processes so that in particular baby boomers can be in good shape 10 or 15 years from now. And it's not really too hard for our kids, but for baby boomers, uh, there's really a lot more we can do than people realize to, to remain healthy. But that's just bridge one, and that'll bring us to bridge two, which is only about 15 years from now, 10, 15 years from now, where we'll have the maturing of the biotechnology revolution where we're literally reprogramming the information processes that underlie biology. We, we, we have tools now, for example, RNA interference, which just got the Nobel Prize about a week ago, uh, that can turn genes off. And so you can turn off viral diseases, you can turn off the genes that, that promote or enable disease processes like atherosclerosis and cancer to continue. We can add new genes to gene therapy. We can turn on and off enzymes. We can literally reprogram biology away from disease and away from, from aging. And that will give us a substantial amount of additional time. And, but it's not a static situation. If we go out another 10 years or so, we'll have the third bridge of the nanotechnology revolution where we can literally rebuild uh, at the molecular and cellular level our bodies and brains uh, using nanotechnology. And that then we'll, we'll, for example, we'll have nanobots, blood cell size devices that can go inside the body and keep us healthy from inside. If that sounds fantastically futuristic, I'd point out there's four major conferences about doing that already in animals with first generation nanotechnology applications. So that will really enable us to dramatically expand human longevity. So we're gonna go from bridge to bridge to bridge. But right now, it's actually important to apply bridge one and aggressively apply the, the moving landscape of knowledge we have on how to remain healthy.
Well, let's agree then to meet again in 40 years and talk about where we are. Thank you very much. My pleasure.